Good morning. Good morning. Seems like it's been a year since we've been here, doesn't it? Feels that way to me. Every Saturday night there's going to be snow, okay? So get ready, get used to it. It's winter. It's Indiana. Next weekend, though, I heard it's going to be 85. In Florida. Well, welcome. Glad you're here. A uh, couple quick announcements. First of all, if you're new this morning, you're... We're thrilled that you're here. Please fill out that little slip on the bottom right of your bulletin. It's a little tear out thing. Put it in the offering plate as our guest this morning. Uh, a couple of updates on announcements. There's a mentoring meeting this, this afternoon, right after worship. It is for the people who are gonna be the mentors, not for the youth. So uh, if you're gonna be a mentor, there's lunch provided for you. So uh, come on out to that meeting. That's gonna be over by the kitchen. Giving statements are available. They're out in the lobby area, so please pick yours up today. If you don't pick it up, it will be mailed to you tomorrow. So, Phil Prophet. Hi, I'm Phil Prophet. I teach the Sunday school class called the Cornerstone class, along with Kevin Thompson, who helps me teach. And we're starting a new series called Resurrection next Sunday, and I would like to invite any adult that would like to be in that class to come. We're going to, this study will lead us right up to the Easter, time of Easter. And what the study does, it, it explains how the most, the greatest life-changing event in history, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, how that should affect our daily lives. And I hope you'll come and study with us as we uh, embark on this new study. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Two last things that I want to tell you. First of all, there is a, a new birth. I think there's a picture. Read here, so all the words. Yes. Oh, he's a handsome boy. Elaine. Well, honestly, take my word for it. <laughs> Aubrey and Keith had a baby boy on Thursday. Uh, yeah. Elaine's got 100 pictures on her phone if you want to see them, but congratulations to Aubrey and Keith. I want to read to, you know, you all know that I coach basketball, and there's other coaches in here. I get these emails and one of them, an email was, how basketball coaches can overcome stress. Because I don't know if you know, in coaching there's a little bit of stress. If you've ever seen me, Debbie's like, she sends me text messages during games. So loud. The first one, do you? She, she, no, I won't go there. Uh, <laughs> the first one was regular exercise, okay? The second one I found really interesting. I have no idea who the writer is, but the, the title is Prayer, Reading Scripture, and Meditation. Prayer, Reading Scripture, and Meditation create an in... <laughs> I thought it was about what I'm saying. And when you read scripture and you pray, this is what, no. Here you go, read Harrison Elliott. Read. See, read, read. Okay, whatever. All right. There's the baby. I thought the Oz were for me. My goodness. No Oz for me, huh? Well, let me read this, y'all. You know, be quiet. <laughs> Prayer, reading scripture, and meditation create an internal rest with mental alertness that lowers heart rate, reduces inflammation, lowers the production of cortisol and adrenaline, and normalizes blood pressure. This level of mental focus also releases the neurotransmitters, serotonin, which eases tension, dopamine, which creates pleasurable feelings, and endorphins, which aids in euphoric effects that assist in reducing stress levels. I thought it was pretty cool that in the thing about coaching basketball and reducing stress, someone's writing about reading scripture and prayer. But let me tell you one thing. It's not only good for basketball coaches, it's good for all of us. Would you pray with me as we go to worship? 
Father, we thank you today that we could be here. We could be in your house. We could worship you. Lord, help us in all that we do this morning that we would be open to your call, to your spirit. Our hearts would be open. We would celebrate you. Then we'd go into the world and we would seek to make a difference. And we would do it because you've made a difference in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand? Would you greet your neighbors? Wish them Christ's love.
Do you know who holds tomorrow? Do you have that assurance in your life this morning? Whether it's minus one outside or 85 next week, that God is there, ever present. All you have to do is call upon his name. He's there whether you, whether you call on his name or not. He just is waiting on you. So please uh, ponder that anew as we sing this song for you this morning.
thank you for the blessings that you bring into our lives. Lord, as we come to you this morning, help us to have the confidence, the assurance that we know who holds tomorrow, that we know who holds us today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Every day we know that it's you, that you hold us in the palm of your hand. Even during the tough times, even during times of financial distress and sickness, death, grief, we know, Lord, that you're there and that you're not going to abandon us. You're not going to fail us. You don't forsake us, but you promise to be with us always, always, always. And so help us to have that confidence in whatever is going on in our lives. We can turn to you and we would know that you are there. Lord, we especially lift up some who are going through difficult times right now. We pray for Brent Park as he awaits some results of tests and next steps in possible treatment for cancer. Pray, Lord, for Lee Simpson as he struggles in the hospital with pneumonia. We pray for Craig Langley after a diagnosis that uh, revealed more cancer in his body and uh, we pray Lord that you'd give each one of these folks not just your wisdom and knowledge but so much of a greater sense of your presence that they would know you really are there and you do hold tomorrow you hold today you hold you always hold us and as we struggle we would know that you are there We pray for those who are struggling with other issues that I haven't mentioned, just the, the physical ailments, financial struggles, emotional, mental, spiritual struggles that we have, those things that are ongoing that sometimes we don't think that we can get out of. And yet, Lord, you've promised that we can call on your name. And when we do, you are there. We pray, Lord, for those who are in the military. Remember Christian Brown as he, this week, is going to be traveling from Germany to Portugal. Pray, Lord, for all those who are serving, that you'd give them safety. You'd help them to have a sense of purpose and understanding. We pray for those in our government, for our president, our leaders. We pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and knowledge not wisdom and knowledge that is man-made, but wisdom and knowledge that comes from you, 
to help each person who is serving, that they would bring honor and glory to you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that you give us to serve. Help us, Lord, to see you, that we would experience your light and then be able to go out into the world and be a light to the world. And now, Lord, as we prepare to take an offering, we're thankful, Lord, for the blessings. We have so many material blessings. You have blessed us so abundantly. And it's our opportunity to give back. We give back to build your kingdom. But we also thank you, Lord, for sending your son Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior. That's the greatest blessing that we could ever have. And so as we give, we give joyfully. We give as cheerful givers. We pray, Lord, for this church, that we would take these offerings and use them to build your kingdom, to serve you. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. If you were to ask my sisters, they would have told you that I was cheap when I was growing up. I grew up in the 70s. I didn't have a lot of money. When it came time for group gifts, I always kicked in my $2. That's all they expected. That's all I got. I'd like to think that today I'm not cheap. I'm frugal, I'm thrifty, I seek bargains, I use coupons, I try to get the best deal that I can. I mean, why not? Don't we, if we're being smart, calculate the cost of things that we're going to do? If you're going to buy a home, we were at the home show yesterday. I'll tell you, there were numbers flying through my head last, yesterday. 
Now, how much would this cost? Oh, this would be great. This would be all. Oh. Calculating the cost of all that we do. I have two boys in college. Calculus book last semester, last year, cost over $300. I look online to find the best deals I can when it comes to books. Whatever I'm going to buy, I try to calculate what I'm going to do when it comes to career decisions, we do that. We should be doing that for all of our major decisions. But on the other hand, shouldn't we be doing this on our daily decisions? I mean, does God really care what color my socks are? Does God care about what I'm going to wear, of what I'm going to say? Does God care about my actions? When you put something on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, Snapchat, I don't, I don't know, whatever else is out there. Is God pleased with what we're doing? Are we able to bring honor and glory to God with what we're doing? That was a question we actually talked about at our staff meeting this week. About bringing honor and glory to God with all that we do. We should be doing it on a daily basis. We should be trying to figure out how can I honor God? Well, we're in our fourth week of the year. We're looking at the fact that God has called us. And the fact that God has called us, he's called us into ministry, and we all have a purpose. We all have a plan that's been set out by God. It's a matter of us to discover God's call, and then, and then to participate and to accept that call and to follow wherever God is leading us. None of us, none of us, are an accident. We were created by the master architect, by God. Some people are going to balk. They're going to walk away from God's call. Some are actually going to accept it for a bit, and then when they realize it's a little bit too tough or too intense, they're going to back away, and some will just jump in and follow God wherever they're called to follow. Serving God isn't for a select few. It's for every believer. If you believe that, then the question ultimately is, what are you going to do with the call? Because God is calling you. And yet the path, that journey to follow Jesus isn't always easy. Sometimes we're called to do things that we've never imagined. Sometimes we're called to move to a different part of the world. Sometimes even just to a different part of the state or some other part in the U.S. Next week, I'm going to share a scripture that was very real to me, one that ultimately helped lead me to follow God and to become a Christian and also to ultimately get into ministry because who I am today is very different from who I was 30 years or so ago. But for now, I want us to look at a passage from Luke chapter 9. It's really a, it's really a pretty harsh sounding words from Jesus. If we don't understand what Jesus is getting at, then, then it could really sound like he's being mean, demeaning, and rude to those who are approaching him. So let's look at this passage from Luke chapter 9. As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, Jesus said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So this sounds pretty harsh, pretty in your face by Jesus. 
Some guys want to follow Jesus. And Jesus isn't very welcoming. It's almost like he's laying down the law and turning them away. You'd think he would be a little bit more accommodating, more welcoming. I, I really believe we tend to get easily distracted. Can you think about how many times you walk into a room and you forget what you came for? How many times have you been in a conversation with someone and you get interrupted and you cannot remember what you were talking about and you need to have that person remind you and they can't remind you either? Or you want to chime in in the middle of a conversation. You want to jump in with something that is just great that's going to solve the problem. And then when it comes to you, you have no clue what your great idea was. How easily distracted we are. You see, I believe Satan also uses distraction as a way to move us further from following Jesus. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. And I've never asked you to do this. I'll probably never ask you to do this again, okay? But I need you to just to work with me. If you have a cell phone, take it out. Now, how many pastors are going to ask you to take out your cell phone in church? If you have it, take it out and keep holding on to it. Because I want to give you some statistics. The average person will check their cell phone 110 times a day. In a 12-hour day, that means you've checked your phone nine times every hour or once every six and a half minutes. That's pretty amazing. 55% of cell phone users text while driving. 84% of cell phone users don't believe they could go a day without their phone. And 50% of teens believe they're addicted to their phones. I'd say a few adults are probably addicted too. Now, I want to give you a test and you don't have to raise your hand because I don't want you to feel guilty. But how many of you, when you picked up your phone and held it, actually checked to see if you had a message? You see, we can't even go and listen to what I'm saying. Oh, oh, well, wait, well, wait a minute. Let me just... How easily distracted are we? Some point during this message, you're going to wonder what's for lunch. You're wondering about it now that I said it. <laughs> you're going to think about something other than what I'm talking about. It's not easy to hold our attention. We get distracted so easily. From this passage, Jesus identifies and calls out three ways that we're distracted when it comes to following him in mission, and so, some ways that are, are not very easy. As they're walking on a road, a man walks up to Jesus and tells him, I will follow you wherever you go. Think about that statement. I'll follow you anywhere you go, Jesus. I will follow you. What do you think Jesus would, man, welcome aboard. But Jesus looks at him and says, foxes have holes and birds of the year have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. This guy's been struck by something about Jesus and Jesus comes back with this. I, I believe Jesus is warning this guy. I believe he's warning us as well that following him is not going to be as easy and carefree as we might think it is. Now let me tell you, following Jesus, being a pastor can be a blast. But there are also hardships associated with being a follower, a disciple, a worker for Jesus. Jesus wanted this man to know he's not going to be staying in five-star hotels. He's not going to be able to get great meals every day and wear the best clothes because he's hanging out with the Son of God. Jesus wants this man to know that Jesus is an alien in this world, a sojourner, kind of like a nomad. Following Jesus would be like following an Old Testament prophet 
who is given a message from God and is traveling around and around and around and is spreading a message all over the place. Not like a teacher who would stay in one area for a period of time, but the prophet would keep on moving and that's what your life would be like. That's what Jesus is getting at. To follow Jesus means that you are most likely going to have to get out of your comfort zone. How easy is it to talk about Jesus? How often do you do that with people at work? How often do you tell them, oh, I went to church yesterday. Let me tell you what we talked about. Or let me tell you what I did to serve Jesus. Let me tell you about what I just read. How often do we tell people in words? And how often do we tell people with our actions? Because we fear we might be forsaken, rejected, mocked, laughed at. We don't hear how this person responds. But there's an implication that they probably left and didn't follow Jesus. If we were to be brutally honest, most of us would say, I don't mind following Jesus as long as he doesn't ask me to do something that's going to take me out of my comfort zone. Because we want to be comfortable, don't we? I mean, honestly, who wants to get out of their comfort zone? I don't. But oftentimes the call is to move out. Think about all the things Jesus had his disciples do. Sending them out for weeks with no cash, no extra clothes, no plan B. And ultimately, Jesus would model this comfortless life by dying on the cross. Think about all of the undesirables that they came in contact with. All the lepers, the sick, the lame the blind. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to touch that person to minister to them? You might have to. He might ask you to do that. So Jesus cautions us. Before jumping in, consider this might get a little bit messy. Jesus talks about our commitments. To a second person, Jesus said, follow me. But the man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus gave this harsh statement again, let the dead bury their own dead. But it's for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Who wouldn't tell someone, go and bury your parent. And when you're ready, come and find me and we'll put you to work. And if you think this is harsh, wait till next week, because the passage next week is harsher. But think about it. If this man's father had died, where would he be? He'd be with his family. He'd be making the preparations. It's believed that this man's father was fully alive. And it might be weeks, months, or years before the father died. And then this guy is going to come and follow Jesus. That's what's at work behind the scenes. Jesus wants this guy to understand the urgency to the mission that he's called us to. It's not something we pick up when our schedule finally has some breathing room. I mean, when's the last time your schedule had some breathing room? And when it does, what do you do? You add more to your schedule. But it's supposed to be our first priority. Now, it sounds harsh. It really does. But there's nothing more that could be done for a person who's died. Their fate, their eternity is sealed. We can't pray that person into heaven. It's all contingent upon their faith in Christ. But what's really urgent is the offer of life for the living. It's a tough call for many of us. Yet when we think about it, Jesus is right. 
it is pretty in your face. Let the dead bury the dead. It's one of those statements that doesn't seem right, yet it's a statement that Jesus is making, which helps us to realize what is important. I really don't believe Jesus would have gone up to someone whose parent had just died and said, nope, you can't follow me. Or, no, no, you must follow me, I'm sorry. He said, you go. You go and honor your mother and father. You show them the honor and respect that is due them. And you do what you need to do as their child. He never condemned those who were grieving. Think about the woman who was burying her son, the people who were grieving for Lazarus. Nobody is condemned for sadness and grief. Jesus wept. Jesus doesn't condemn you for grieving or doing what's needed for your family. He's reminding us of how easy it is to make excuses and become distracted. We fall into those traps. We tell Jesus, oh, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I need to fill in the blank. Lord, I'll serve you first, but let me get through this busy season. Lord, I'd like to start giving, but let me get this promotion first. Lord, I, I'm going to start to read the Bible, but I'll, I'll wait for the first of the year. I'll wait until the month starts. I'll wait for whatever. Jesus is reminding us his mission is a priority. And yet Jesus gives this man some positive steps. Even though this man is not ready to follow Jesus, Jesus still tells him, if you're not going to follow me, here's something you can do. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. You don't have to walk hand in hand with me. You don't have to be by my side to go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Just go and do it. Go out into the world. Be at your workplace. Be in your school. Be at the store. Be wherever you are and proclaim the kingdom. That's a daily call for us. If we can't follow Jesus into the mission field, then at the minimum, proclaim Christ. Proclaim him. That alone can change the world. Proclaim him and then live like him so the world could see Jesus in you. And there's only one person who stops us from doing that, and that's ourselves. Then we come to the final person. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I don't know if that's tough love, if it's harsh. Is Jesus really telling this guy, hey, dude, if you really want to go and say goodbye to your family first, then you're not worthy of following me. Is that really where he's... But, but it's a theme that's present in the Bible. Lot's wife. Look back at Sodom and longed for what she had. How often did the Israelites, after they left Egypt, long for what they had, slavery? How long, how often did they complain to God and to Moses? How many times have we clung to what is behind us, longed for the good old days? instead of embracing the good new days. Can you imagine meeting Jesus and leaving with him and never saying goodbye to your family? It almost seems disrespectful and rude to your family, not, not even a text message, hey, I'm leaving. Notice something about this man though. He uses this a word we're going to hear about in a bit. He says, but, but, but I want to go back 
to my family, big butts and little butts. I knew you'd get that. <laughs> this guy is trying to make a deal with Jesus. I'll go with you, but, oh, I'd love to follow you, Jesus. How many times do we use that as an excuse? Oh, I'll do this, but I'd love to help. Oh, I love you, but I'm all in, but I'll follow you, but how often do we do that? Jesus tells us, you cannot go forward if you keep looking backwards. I know we've got farmers in here. How many of you are looking forward? I know now it's automated. How many of you are looking forward when you're planting? You're not looking back. How many of you have driven a car and are looking at something on the side of the road? Where does your car tend to go? To that same side. You're looking, I'm holding the wheel straight and without realizing you're turning and you're veering off. Go into the Family Life Center today. Do a test. Close your eyes and walk. You're going to walk in a straight line? You're going to concentrate on it as hard as you possibly can, and odds are you're not going to walk in a straight line because we can't. And that's his point. If you think you're going to go forward and keep looking back to what you used to have, you're never going to go forward because you're going to hold on to, you're just going to cling to what I had. Oh, I don't want to let go of it. It's what Paul said to the church in Philippi. Notice the first word he uses in the statement to the church. In Philippians 3, Paul wrote, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He uses the word but, but it's in a positive sense as he's contrasting what he just talked about. But one thing I'm doing, I'm going to forget what lies, but I'm going to forget about my old life where I had all the perks in the world. I was the up and coming high priest. I was going to have it all, but I'm going to let that all go. I'm not going to go back and mourn and grieve over what I'm leaving behind because I am going to go forward. I'm going to strain forward so that I can reach the prize. And that prize is the call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul's doing. That's the call for us in our lives. There are a lot of things that are calling for our attention. Sometimes it's hard to let go of those past things because the past always represents, or the, or the present, always represents our comfort. And the future is the unknown. And that represents what we don't know, what we don't have yet. But we need to be like Paul to move forward to learn from the past and then to leave it behind and to strain forward so that others would know the power of God's love and the power of his grace. Well, I wanna end with a video. It's about a three minute video. I think you'll catch on real quick because it's a play on one word. So I think you're gonna get it pretty quickly if we could show that video. <laughs> I got a, got a big butt. It's gigantic, if I'm gonna be blunt about it. And you know what, the funny thing is, I got several big butts. And, and, and before, you, before you discard me or, or wince at the disgusting notion of that, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and suggest that possibly you have at least one big butt as well. Yeah, you like that? Hurts a little, huh? Let me tell you something. Let me just tell you something, okay? Everybody we know has a big butt. And more often than not, it's the thing that actually gets in the way of us living a consistent life for Jesus. Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to expound a little bit, okay? See if you can recognize some of these butts.
but I have to work more. But my favorite TV show is on. But my kids have practice, but I gotta tweet something. But it's such a beautiful day. But I'm just not in the mood. But I deserve a break today. You see, everything kind of interferes with my life of, of just living an authentic life for God, okay? And more often than not, it always has something to do with some sort of butt, okay? Even the littlest of butt can distract me. It really can. The littlest of butt can make me think, well, I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to think about it today. I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Whatever God asked me to do, I seem to have a butt for it and get away, okay? And the most horrendously big butt of all time is the butt that gets in the way of me just hanging out with God and reading his word. It's true. Think about it. All the times you're about to open that, and all of a sudden, a big giant butt gets in the way. A butt much like one of these. But I got a farm bill, but I'm tired, but the game's over, but I read last Tuesday, but I gotta check Facebook, but I don't like Leviticus, but it's too hot in here, but I, I just don't like books, but I don't understand it, but it's boring. But what does that have to do with me in the 21st century? Those are some ugly butts, people. Let's just call them what they are, ugly, ugly butts. Okay, and there's a lot more to them, sad but true. Here's a list, although not exhaustive, of some of the most popular butts known to mankind. But I don't have enough money yet. But others will think that I'm a nerd if I carry the Bible. But they won't like me if I talk about Jesus. But I don't know if God will do what I ask. But I just can't get motivated. But I'm afraid. But I don't have all the answers. But the small group is the same night as Monday Night Football. But can I just let my life speak for itself? But I'm not happy. But that's not my gift. That's the pastor job. But I don't know how to pray. But I can't believe that. But I don't know where to start. But everybody else is having fun. Butts abound, friend. But, 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 but. Here a butt, there a butt, everywhere. A butt butt, okay? And, and, and the most overused butt of all time, but I just don't have enough time. Really? Oh, come on, we have a lot of butts. God has given us a real simple word, okay? If we learn it, and we share it, and we teach it, and we live by it, then see, God gets glorified, people benefit, and then we get blessed. That's why we do what we do. That's the why behind the butt, okay? And ultimately, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here, my fellow butt lovers, is if your butt is bigger than your why, then your butt's too big. Okay, it's time to, metaphorically speaking, snap into a Slim Jim. Okay, let's slap on some spiritual shape-ups and hit the road a little bit so we can just manage the butts a little bit. That's all we're trying to do. That's what we're talking about. Let's minimize the excuses. Let's shrink the butts. Shrink the butts. Say it with me. Shrink the butts. That's what we need to do. And you and I can do that together. We can conquer this. You and I can do it if we start today, okay? I know we can. Let's just do it. No ifs, ands, or... Yeah. I think you get it. No more butts, right? Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you call us to follow you. Sometimes that call is really difficult. Sometimes we're called to get out of our comfort zone. We can make lots of excuses. But Lord, help us. Help us in the funny way sounding it, to shrink those butts. That we would really put aside our discomfort and realize not just the discomfort, but the pain that you went through for us. Leaving the perfection of heaven, the joy, the peace, the love, the power to come here, to live for us, to die for us, to rise again to give us hope and to give us a spiritual power that we still don't even comprehend. You did that for us. And so Lord, help us as we move through our days that we would be open to your calling and that we would follow you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. We pray in your precious name, amen. As we prepare for our final song this morning, if you've heard some part of the message say, you know, I, I don't know Jesus, I've put him aside for a long time and I need to know him. I'd encourage you to come forward during our final song or if it's a need for prayer to come forward, we can pray together. If it's a desire to join this church to come forward and we will pray together, we will celebrate the work Christ is calling you to do. George. Will you please stand and sing with us? I can hear my Savior calling. 
I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, oh. together. Go out this week into the world. Go make a difference. Follow Christ wherever he calls you to go. Make a difference in the world. Paul. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we lift you up. We thank you for all you do for us each day. Lord, as we go forth this week, that today, this week, this year, help us to put the butts big and small. Put them aside. Help us to follow you. In your name we pray. Amen.